thank you so much for coming out. Um, it's ridiculously early on a Tuesday morning in Las Vegas, um, but I'm incredibly fortunate that you decided to spend your time with us. Uh, this is really for you. So let's everyone get stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. I want you all to quickly give yourself a round of applause. Hold on. But I want you to do it in slow clap fashion because I just love a slow clap. All right. So hold on, hold on. OK. On my count, ready? I'm going to put this away. Ready? Get your mind right. Get your mind right. Faster. Faster. Woo! Yeah! Woo! OK, sit down. That's fine. That's good. Awesome. Awesome. I've always wanted to like, lead a room to do that in Vegas. This is fantastic. Um, my name is Kevin Lau. I am from Google out of the Austin, Texas uh, office. Um, I recently uh, joined Google uh, in Austin uh, about a couple months ago. Uh, but I'm born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Anyone here from Detroit? Yeah, Motor City, what's up? Awesome. We're going to go through a ton of data. And so a couple disclaimers. One, no one here is on the line yet. Uh, what we're about to propose and we're about to go through is highly lucrative, but has great potential. And I'm thoroughly excited to go through all the, the research with you. And actually, over the last two months, I've looked at the research study that we're about to present. And there was like 152 slides. We're not going through all 152 slides, I promise you. I only pulled out the, the real things I think that you can go home and take away from this particular seminar. And I'm really excited to share it with you all. Are you all excited? Awesome. Fantastic. So let's take a look. This is the fifth year we've done this study, the Google Automotive Path to Purchase study. We spent over a million dollars on this thing. It's meaty. 5,666 total respondents. That's the most we've ever had. It's actually double from last year. And there's actually two parts to this, to this survey. So I'm going to talk about the methodology really quickly. Um, one, to the left here, is a survey that entails over 40 questions. Uh, to people who have recently purchased a vehicle. Uh, questions are about the sources they used, the different influences of ad format, device, video, and touch points utilized during their last year. Uh, the respondents, the 5,666 that you see here, uh, that includes uh, buyers of all brands, ages, demos, new certified pre-owned lease. In addition, the 5,600 total respondents actually has the largest sample size of new purchasers that we've ever had. It's actually double of 1,800 from last year. Now, the second part of the study is actually a little bit unique compared to what other vendors do. We took a look at over 12,500 click streams of actual purchasers. So what this means is that instead of like the standard survey responses after you purchase a car, uh, we take a look at actual behaviors online. Uh, types of searches, the query paths, time spent on site. Um, and new to this year was YouTube usage. And so I'm really excited to go through this. And we're going to go through three items about today's consumer. Chances are you probably know this, but we have some data to back this up. One, today's consumers are constantly cross-shopping. 63% uh, of those polled enter the market uncertain on a model. car, SUV, crossover, and the parity between models and the undoubted number of resources available to do that, to do that research contributes to this factor. In addition, up to four brands were actually considered. That's up from three in 2013. Next, today's consumers are really fast. When someone visits the dealer today, chances are they've already made up their mind. In fact, 20% of auto shop, US auto shoppers said, I learned as much as I could online and only went to the dealer to confirm my decision or to complete the paperwork. It's fascinating. Today's consumers are brand agnostic. 65% switched 
from previous brands owned. So what they have in the garage is not what they actually buy in the store. And to bring this home, I wanted to share a quick story. It's a little personal, if that's all right, for early Tuesday morning in Vegas. So those are my two best friends, uh, Thomas and Kevin. Uh, I grew up in Michigan in, mid in the Midwest, and these guys are like my brothers. If they were to call me right now, and you, some of you have friends like these, if they call me right now and say, hey, Kevin, I need you to jump in front of this train at this time. I say, fantastic, where? Where are we going, right? If, if I'm asking loyalty from you, you're getting it from me. And if you were to ask my friends, you ask my family, I'm as loyal as they come. However, if you were to take a look at my buying history for vehicles, you would actually see the contrary. So I'm gonna dive you in into like my car purchase history and a quick disclaimer or asterisk, uh, this is not a product endorsement. Um, and by no means or shape or form am I looking to, uh, to, to, to derail the, the conversation, but I, want th I, I found this to be pretty, pretty interesting. So my first car, first vehicle, yeah. 1999 Nissan Sentra, SE, yeah. yeah. You usually pay extra for that back in 99, yeah. And yes, it was gold, not Olympic gold, it was just gold, yeah, yeah. The next one, 2007 Toyota Solara, silver, yeah. It was, it was awesome, I was able to use that car and, like, pay, and use it to, to, for a down payment on the Solara. Ended up totaling it, that's all right. Um, then I got a 2005 Honda Civic Coupe. Gray, I think, I think the actual color code was satin silver metallic. Yeah, yeah. Drove that puppy for a while. Then, got my first US car. Got the 2011 Chevy Equinox. Yeah, LS, yeah, fully loaded, yeah. Um, not at all, not even a little bit. Then I wanted to see what the fuss was about, and for those of you giving me looks in the room right now, I understand. 2013 BMW X3 xDrive 28i. It's a handful right there. Want to see what it's all about. I wanted a crossover. I wanted four-wheel drive. Michigan winters are brutal. But just four days ago, I test drove my next car. And, you know, with all things considered, I'm excited to buy it. It's a 2016 uh, Ford Fusion. We all go back home again, right? Detroit. Ford Tough. And, if you, and I, I looked at this, I was like, man, I didn't buy one brand over and over and over again. My family was a Ford family. We grew up with, with Fords our whole lives. And I did not buy one yet. Well, so what does this mean? Cust customers and consumers are just taking different routes. Do shoppers need dealer service anymore? Do they need to, to go in there? They do, right? The reality is that they're reaching you, the dealerships, through different routes, quite off the path that we typically see. And it's only getting more intense. 75% of auto purchaser, purchaser research time is spent on digital. That's only growing year over year, and over the past five years, this is the highest it's ever been. On this next slide, I want you to do me a favor. When you see visited a dealership on the next slide I'm about to show you. I want you to raise your hand. Ready? Go. Cool. 24. That's the average number of touch points, research bits that today's consumer are going through before they even end up buying that vehicle, 19 of which are digital. Yes, it starts with Google, but that's just one start. That's just one, that's one aspect of the 24. They don't even get to the dealership until part number 22, stage 22. Amazing stuff. Searching on Google, inquiring family and friends, visiting a website, brand page, influenced by online ad, looked at photos, watch video on YouTube, use a loan calculator on a third-party site, 
watched a video and ad, searched on mobile, searched a dealer, saw a TV ad, visited a dealer website, located a dealer for mobile, clicked on a display ad, used a model comparison tool, visited new newspaper sites, read, read consumer reviews, filled out a form, and actually visited the lot. That's a lot. There's a lot going on here. The reason why this is is that, last I checked, today's average US household income is roughly around $57,000, give or take a couple of thousand. Today's consumer just cannot afford to make the wrong decision. Whether it's a tube of toothpaste or their next car purchase, that car is taking them to and from work, taking their kids to and from soccer practice. They need that thing to be reliable, probably gas efficient, and ultimately, they want to make sure they're making the right decision. They research more, but decide quicker. Time spent researching vehicles has actually gone up over the past year, and this may not seem surprising. Um, however, it's actually up from 13.75 in 2013. However, after you get through all this research, they're in the market, most are in the market, for less than three months. They've already made up their mind, and they're ready to buy. So the old mantra is, hey, let's get the customers into the dealership, do whatever it takes to get them in the door. Today, we should change that. We need to flip that. It's do whatever it takes to bring the dealership to customers by building your presence online across important channels that shoppers visit for their purchase decision. And if you do this right, your market coverage will extend beyond the five, 10 mile radius that you currently have for your dealership. Because thanks to online research, today's shoppers can research broader areas and are willing to travel longer distances for that dealership and for that purchase. Awesome. So this is the title of the, of the seminar, right? This is why you kind of walked into the door. Video, the new showroom. I love video. Traditional viewership has changed. This should be to no surprise for anyone in the room. Um, over the past three years, we've seen an uptick, 24% percentage points uptick on time spent on online video. And it's harder to reach your audience with TV alone. How many of you have a tablet? I've got two, I have no idea why I have two. But, but we used to live in a world world where media was scarce, right? And you could actually get in front of your target TV audience during a finite time, primetime television, probably 80 to 90% of your audience during primetime television. That's no longer the case. We've got tablets, I've got two. We've got mobile devices, some of you have more than two. We have TVs, we have a laptop, so we have streaming devices, we've got Netflix, we've got all these different forms of media, right? And the studies are showing that the time spent online, especially for these millennials, are heavily weighted towards online video and away from TV. YouTube reaches more shopper, auto shoppers than any other cable network across the country. Yeah, when I went through this research, I was like, what? Over, across, over CNN, ESPN, TNT, TBS, really? And across all the markets, West Coast, Central, Midwest, South, Southeast, and East. YouTube has the top reach of adults 25 to 54 auto purchasers of online video sites or cable watched in the past 30 days. And YouTube is the video destination for auto shoppers. More than 4 million in-market video views on YouTube every day. That's up 220% year on year. So by the time Brian and I are done with our presentations today, there would have been about 135,000 video views on YouTube on auto content, auto related content on YouTube. It's fascinating stuff. So what do they do after? This is great, Kevin. They watch a ton of video online. I get it. But what do they do after? This is where it gets fun. Top one is to use my computer to find information. That makes sense. They'll visit a dealership and they'll actually go and search a dealership's inventory. For those of you that are taking pictures and taking notes, this is probably where you want to take one. 
what do they want? When a consumer or potential consumer is on YouTube, what are they looking for? These are the top five. They want to watch somebody else test drive the vehicle, which I thought would be pretty funny. Highlights of a vehicle, features and options. Vehicle walkarounds. Vehicle safety tests. And consumer reviews. People will trust a third party review from someone they don't even know on YouTube just as much as they would their best friend. And for those of you that don't know, YouTube is the second largest search engine behind Google. We see a ton of searches each and every day for content related to auto as well as do it yourself. And for those of you on the ad side, uh, the ads at the top two here are the search ads and then we actually have display ads. Brian's gonna be talking about opportunities for and tactics to incorporate video into your, into your marketing media mix. Uh, and, but just so you know, if you don't have video content, that's okay. There's opportunities to advertise on YouTube without video. And they're fairly easy to execute. The format that I love is what's called YouTube TrueView. Has anyone heard of YouTube TrueView before? Okay, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, let me just quickly go over the core, the core concepts. Um, and it's, hopefully th those of you have seen the pre-roll ads on YouTube, correct? Okay, so before the, the actual YouTube video loads, the one that you actually came there to, to watch, uh, uh, an ad will show. And at the five second mark, a skip ad button shows up on the, like the bottom right hand side, and it gives you the option to skip the ad. Now what's great about the YouTube TrueView ad format is that you, you as the advertiser don't pay for that view unless the consumer, the viewer, hits 30 seconds or the video ends, which, whichever comes first. It's a highly cost-effective way to understand engagement and to see what people are actually interested in. Fun fact on YouTube, the Super Bowl. People spend millions and millions of dollars on advertisements on Super Bowl. Every single ad that you see on the Super Bowl is actually A-B tested, meaning they'll test different creatives, on YouTube a week prior before they go live for the big show. There's also an opportunity to understand your brand and how that's resonating with the public. It's a, it's a, it's a function called the brand lift. Basically what happens is that we'll serve an ad uh, to test and control groups and then afterwards, that viewer is actually asked a survey, and then insights are given to you in an inside report, which allows you to see if your ad is actually being effective and what that's creating for your, for your brand. And most are seeing the impact of this. This is a, a small case study that we did with, with Dodge Ram. Uh, it says, many of the prospects were not calling for an appointment or interacting with the sales team via email. They were simply appearing. Across this, this case study, they were able to find 18,000 completed views. They saw a 54% increase in their sales and a 300% increase in monthly grand caravan sales. So what do you do with all this information? First things first, get it online. Upload your content. Brian's gonna come up here and talk about some of those tactics. First and foremost is that you can get online today. And it doesn't have to be anything special. You can take out your phone, videotape a, a, a testimonial, videotape yourself walking around a vehicle, upload it on YouTube, and it's there for free. Get in front of the shopper. Target in mar market shoppers, have a presence on search, and you can remarket to users outside of YouTube. In addition, if you decide to work on, to use YouTube, you can actually remarket to people that are on YouTube to get them to your website. And last but not least, the call to action and measure it. Digital gives you that opportunity to measure interactions in real time. Time is money in this business, and I understand that. And this is a great opportunity for you to get in front of today's consumer. With that being said, I'm gonna invite up VP of Strategic Accounts, Brian Kroll from AdTaxi. Yep, yep. Yep. 
Can you hear me now? Better? Cool. All right, so thanks, Kevin, for that. Um, been uh, doing a lot of these types of things, and we speak and partner with Google a lot on these types of opportunities. And uh, every time I, I speak with Google, I'm amazed at uh, the content that they bring up. Um, I always kind of feel like I'm, I'm Eric Clapton sitting in the audience after watching Hendrix opening for him, and now I'm just like, I've got to follow this now. This is awesome. But uh, at any rate, I want to kind of run you guys through uh, the options that are non-YouTube for video. So it's pretty amazing stats. There are over 2 billion video views every single day happening across the real-time bidding exchanges in the US. And of those, about 365 million of them are from projected in-market shoppers. So um, back to kind of Kevin's point earlier about TV watching. How many of you, just by show of hands, uh, how many of you guys have either yourselves or a family member who no longer watch TV and watch primarily connected or something like that? It's about like a third of the room, that's a lot. It's usually about a half, and it's growing every time I ask that question. So it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And um, you know, with, with what you can do with this, so first off, actually, before we get to the next part, how many of you guys have heard of what real-time bidding is? A couple people? So real-time bidding is essentially, um, it's, there's an auction that's happening across non-Google. Non there's an auction across all of the different video inventory that's there, and it's based on that specific video impression. And so what happens is when a user pulls up the web page, there's a couple things happening. There's the code behind the page that is pulling in advertising spots. There's also the code that's pulling in the content that's going to show on the page. And during the advertising spot, when that code is loading on the page, there's an auction that's happening for those ads. And so it's called a second price auction. And what you see sort of here is, you know, the impression's available, it goes out to the ad exchanges, and then we see bids happening, and there's typically multiple bidders, and those bids may be on multiple different things. Could be somebody is in market to predicted to buy whatever maker model that someone wants to target. It could be that someone has a family with kids, and it could be like that they're interested in playing golf, whatever it may be, there's all kinds of different data that's there that we have access to that we can target these ads to. And essentially, um, the, the highest bid wins. But you don't pay what you bid. You pay one penny more than the second highest bidder. And so when that happens, uh, essentially, you, you win the bid. Your ad shows up. And uh, that ad pops up before pre-roll content. Or it's pre-roll, I should say, before video content that the user was there to see. And in this instance, this is uh, an example I took from MLB.com, where someone was going to look and look at uh, you know, highlights from the All-Star game. And now there's a pre-roll ad showing up for eSurance prior to that content. So this inventory is available across, uh, across multiple different exchanges. Where you can buy this would be going through multiple different video exchanges, uh, or you can go through what's called private marketplace, and you can look at different publishers like the Weather Channel or Forbes, Sporting News. There's tons of them out there just for the sake of not having a screen with too many logos on them. I just focused on a few there. But essentially, there's multiple different ways to reach audiences with video across, across the web. Uh, and there's also multiple different options in terms of what you would want to do. So commonly, um, what, we, what we see most, most likely is going to be in-stream ads. And that's uh, otherwise known as pre-roll. So that's if you're going to go watch a video, there's a 15 or 30 second spot that's going to play before that video that, uh, that would be an advertisement. <clears throat> um, there's also something that's called outstream. Um, this is becoming more prevalent now. And that's, well, let's say, you'll be going to read like a review or something along those lines on a, on a car site, uh, be scrolling down the page. And as you scroll down, all of a sudden, a video will kind of pop up into the content. So that's called outstream video. Um, that's also something that uh, also could be called contextual. Uh, and then the other option that, we, that you see a lot are what we call, what's called in-banner video. And that's, so those would be like the little, uh, little 300 by 250 kind of rectangle that'll be on like the side of the page. And then as the page loads, a video would just kind of start playing right there. Um, my personal preference is I, I prefer more of the in-stream and outstream because it's a little bit more of the, um, the actual con context of what that person's looking for. Uh, it's more sort of that realm. And uh, with video, it's, I, I really love video in the sense that it's, uh, it's, it's showing its sight, sound, and motion. And it's a way to sort of portray and convey emotion with that as well, too. And that's what sort of separates it from the rest of, of the advertising medium in the sense that you know, when you're talking about somebody who's going to be possibly buying a car to the point about what people want to see, they want to see that, they want to see what that experience is like. And it's something that you can't really convey any other way. So there's not, it's not just on the RTB exchanges. Um, there's also a ton of options for video across social media as well, too. So these stats blew me away, but um, it actually makes sense the more I think about it. So people spend more than 100 million hours every single day on Facebook watching video. That's crazy. There are 8 billion video views every single day on Facebook. 
And so Facebook is also um, kind enough to basically give you, uh, in, in terms of targeting, if you want to go in and, and figure out you know, what your objectives are for video advertising, give, we have a matrix here direct from Facebook in terms of what you would want to do based on your, your brand's objective. If you want to drive awareness, consideration, or purchase intent, um, they give you some of the types of things of, in terms of what your main KPIs should be in terms of setting up your campaigns. Um, and then likewise, if you're going for just you know, um, driving, by, driving video views and you just want to get you know, as many um, videos for your, for your budget, as many video views for your budget, um, they have uh, basically like how they would set up the recommended campaign objectives in terms of how you would want to bid and what you would want to tell Facebook to optimize towards. Um, one of, I think, the most effective things that you can do on Facebook is video for direct response. And that's so you can use video remarketing from people who have been to your page, uh, been to your website, and show people videos on Facebook um, based on sort of the content that they're, um, that they're interested in. Um, and that can be either from pages that they visited, or you can build certain custom audiences that I'll get into a little bit later from like a, a lookalike predictive modeling standpoint. But uh, Facebook also has a couple quirks. So all of the videos that are going to appear on Facebook, they're either they're, whether they're organic or sponsored, they're autoplay. And they don't have sound at first. Meaning if I'm just on my Facebook app and I'm just kind of scrolling through on my phone, sitting there watching TV because I'm bored, whatever is also on for a commercial, if a video shows up, there's no sound. So the video will be playing, and actually 85% of all of the videos that are watched on Facebook are watched without sound because people are going through and just kind of looking that way. If I have my headphones in, I went and tapped the, tapped the video and was able to see that, then the sound would start playing, but most of them um, just don't, don't have sound. So there's a, there's a cool option in Facebook's Power Editor where you can basically auto-caption your video. So if you upload a video, Facebook will basically listen to what you're saying and do an auto-caption for you, and hopefully they get it right. Uh, there's no real chances to kind of edit that, unfortunately. Um, but that's a, that's a powerful thing in the sense that you know you can still convey your message as people are scrolling through. They don't have to listen to the sound. They can at least see and catch the brand. So regardless of Facebook or on the real-time bidding side, I want to dive into some of the audience targeting strategies that uh, I think are very effective. So I split this up into two groups because there's really sort of two objectives the way that I look at uh, digital marketing. You're either using it for prospecting or you're using it for remarketing to drive somebody further down the funnel to take an action on your site. So on the prospecting side, um, we typically like to split this up and say, you know, look at sort of a data targeting, um, you know, look at, at basically intent or interest or any kind of demographic targeting, whatever your audience is that you want to reach. Um, that's the, the types of things you can target. And by the way, there's, there's over, I think, 70,000, at least as of a couple months ago, 70,000 actionable data segments that people can target online. And that comes from everywhere. That could be everything from like loyalty card purchases at grocery stores, could be different types of sites you visited. It could be other offline data. There's an immense amount of data that's out there that that you can use to target these ads. And that's because everywhere we go, unless you religiously clear your cookies, you're leaving a data trail. And that may creep people out from a personal standpoint that there's people who know and can target ads to me because I buy Captain Crunch at Safeway. Um, but it's also something where, as a marketer, it's really effective to know that I can put that exact right message in front of that exact right person at the right time on the right device with the right medium. And you can get a really solid return on your investment that way. So um, in addition to data targeting, there's also content or contextual targeting. So that could be either automotive sites or sports sites, interest type sites. Um, and then also my favorite is predictive modeling. And that's based on first party data. And I'll get into that uh, in, in a second on the next slide. On the remarketing side, um, it's really thinking about not necessarily just looking at people who have been to your entire site, but looking at the right pages of the site that you want to remarket to and show you which types of videos you want to show. So if somebody just makes it to your homepage but doesn't go anywhere else after that, it's kind of foolish to go ahead and throw an ad after them and chase them and spend a lot of money to put a video ad out there uh, because that person may have just accidentally visited your site. So we recommend going for people who are looking at specific pages. So like VDPs would be a great thing. People who are looking at you know schedule an appointment, location pages. Um, those are things where uh, you're basically sending out um, <clears throat> you know, those remarketing ads based on some sort of a, a deep engagement metric that's on your site. Um, another thing that you can do on the remarketing side is if you have a prospecting video and somebody watches 100% of your prospecting video, that person by nature cannot actually go visit your site because they've, the prospecting video has now ended and there's no way for them to click through. And now they're there to watch that cat video or whatever it is that they were there to see in the first place. So what you can do is you can segment people who have watched 100% of that video. And by the way, 
video completion rates are 100% is, uh, it's, it's obviously like that's, that's the goal. Um, most of the time, the average is gonna be probably in the 60 to 70% range for these non-TrueView videos. People don't have to watch the whole thing. So they'll watch a certain percentage of it and then they'll either skip out of it if they can skip it or they'll just reload their browser because they don't wanna watch the video. So if you know somebody has watched 100% of your 30 second video, you can infer some pretty good intent there that that person is gonna be in market to what it is that you're, that you're offering. Um, now back to the prospecting and the predictive modeling side. Um, predictive modeling is, I, I think, probably one of the, the, the coolest promises in terms of what we can do with data. And what it basically means is you're taking data analysis on all the first party data that you're gathering from what's happening on your site, you're, you're modeling that and saying, based on what I know about the people who have been to my site so far, let's go out and find more people who have very similar data profiles to that. And so um, you can build custom segments based on where people have been on your site and go out and find more of those same people. So it's something that can be done on the RTV side or also on the social side and also done on, on YouTube as well. But essentially what, it, what it's doing is it's analyzing all of the data segments that are on your site and it's looking at the ones who have the highest likelihood to convert and, um, and improve campaign performance. And it's automatically adjusting that as campaigns progress. And then the, it's also at the same time, it's looking at all the data segments that are least likely to convert and it's scrubbing those out. And so over time, what you end up getting is a really highly fine-tuned audience based on the people who are looking at specific pages or specific vehicles on your site. Uh, and you're able to go ahead and, and serve ads, go find those people who haven't been to your site yet. So you can do the same thing on Facebook. Um, in Facebook, they call them custom audiences. How many of you guys have used this, by the way, on Facebook? So good, so a lot of people. It's the exact same thing on, on the real-time bidding side, it's just Facebook has so much more data on us because we all willingly overshare on Facebook um, that Facebook can do it with uh, a much smaller audience. So with Facebook, um, you can build custom audiences and my personal favorite is something that is, um, that's, that's pretty, fairly new, but essentially you can take offline customer data and you, this would be sort of like, let's say a phone number, email, they actually expanded and it used to be just phone numbers or emails and you had to match 100. They just changed that so it's, now you can have, I think, up to like 16 different disparate sources where if you can combine all that data, they can piece an audience together based on that data. Um, and so a great way to use this would be, let's say we go back through your CRM data and we find everybody who purchased, let's say, let's say you're a Ford dealer and you want to sell Mustangs. Let's say you go back and pull everybody who bought a Mustang for you in the last six months. Upload all of that data into Facebook. Facebook scrubs all of that and now you have a custom audience that you can serve your Mustang video ads to on Facebook. And it goes off against basically you can set it up to either the top 1% of people in your target geography and if that's for like incredibly similar reach or you can do the top 5% which is where you're going to get a little bit more reach and it's not quite a similar audience but still very powerful data. So you're basically using people who have already purchased from you and going out and find more people who have a really highly potential to purchase for you, whether they know it or not, they're probably in the market to buy a Mustang because they have all of the same attributes from the people who've already bought from you. Um, so the way that we type to uh, look at these types of campaigns in terms of how we set these things up is uh, you're, you're looking at it two different ways, right? So there's a prospecting campaign that has its own prospecting budget, and then you also have a remarketing campaign that has a remarketing budget. These two things are working in tandem and they both have very specific goals in terms of what they're gonna do. Um, and you try, you're trying to optimize those towards those goals. So typically what you do from like a prospecting campaign, highly recommend blending uh, an approach where you'll say one ad group would use third party data targeting. That might be someone who would be Polk data who's in market to buy, buy, a, buy a car. You have your first party predictive targeting that you would say based on people who are looking at certain cars on your site. Um, and then you might have contextual or category targeting. Let's go ahead and put that across different types of automotive review sites. All of those things should be optimized to either an engaged site visit that you're tracking afterwards um, using a pixel or uh, also like 100% view. So we recommend optimizing with video, it's all about getting that view out there, getting that message out there. So we recommend optimizing to the lowest effective cost per completed view. Uh, and then you know you're gonna get a significant, it's, it's very similar to, to Truvy, right? So it's like you, you, you're putting your video up there, the goal is to get it watched, optimize to get as many of those watched as possible. And a best practice that we have in terms of um, setting this up is always exclude people who have been to your website before. So you know you're going after, that budget is 100% going after a new prospecting audience. Um, another best practice too, in terms of geotargeting, 
a lot of times people will say, I only want to reach the area that's you know, 5, 10, 15 miles around my dealership. Depending on where your dealership is located, if you're in a large metro area, people may have excessively long commute times. So for instance, I'm, I'm from the, the San Francisco Bay Area. People who live in San Francisco are probably going to be driving potentially an hour or two hours south or east to, to go to work. Um, and so when you want to serve those ads, uh, we recommend targeting a larger radius during the work week and a smaller radius during evenings and weekends um, because whether you like it or not, most people are actually spending their time online at work doing personal things as opposed to work things. We almost always see a spike at 9 a.m. when we analyze automotive data. 9 a.m. on a Monday, massive spikes. That's because everybody who didn't get a car on the weekend is going to look at the cars that, when they're sitting there, they got a case of the Mondays, drinking my coffee. I'm gonna go look to see if that, if that car is still there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a great best practice that works really well to really focus in so that you know that when people are on the evenings and weekends, they are close to you. Um, on the remarketing side of things, um, this is how we like to set up campaigns and how we recommend it. So um, you're, you're not necessarily just going after, as I mentioned earlier, don't remarket everybody who's been to your site. Remarket basic segments. Remarket people who have taken action on your site that is valuable to you, and then you want to go out and find those people again and, and engage with those people. And so uh, like that might be an engaged visitor, somebody who's kind of browsing, looking at category uh, type pages, but not making it down to like the, the uh, VDP yet. Uh, could be people who are looking at your location page, could be people who are looking at VDPs, and you can adjust the bids on what you want to do based on how far down that person is in the funnel. Um, and then you know, ultimately the goal is going to be like an e-price quote or lead submission or something like this. It may be a location page view, but basically you want to have something where there's some sort of intent to say, once somebody's filled out that form, um, that's, that's a win. Um, one other thing I'd recommend too is don't automatically exclude people once they filled out a form because oftentimes we see when people are shopping for cars, they're going to fill out multiple e-price quotes and you can kind of watch what happens through the site where someone may say, all right, I like that, you know, uh, I like that Ford F-150, but I also am interested in this Ford F-150 and I want a price quote on this one as well too. So you want to make sure that you're, you're doing, you're not excluding people necessarily. Um, and then also differentiate the message that you're using with your retargeted video. People have already been to your site. They know who you are. Tell them something different with the video after they've been to your site. Very effective practice. I'll get into that here in a little bit more on the creative side. So uh, with prospecting, you know, as I mentioned, you know, you're, you're using that to basically get out the specific models and serve users videos showing features of those specific models. And so um, it's harder when you have, let's say, uh, two completely different audiences coming to your site. So let's say you're a Toyota dealership. A Prius buyer and a Tundra buyer are going to be two completely different audiences, right? But depending on what your goals are and depending on what your inventory might be, you might decide to focus on, hey, let's just, let's, well, I got to move a lot of Priuses this month. Um, we're going to head and go ahead and build predictive models off of the Prius and then vice versa, whatever that may be for Tundra. Um, and then the call to action on that prospecting video would be get in touch with us. You know, call us, schedule a test drive, come down to the lot, see what we've got. On on uh, the remarketing side of things, that's for people you know, who are going to be doing VDP views or any kind of other event that they have. Use that video to tell the consumer why they should buy from you. you know, Kevin mentioned it earlier, but people are going to a maximum of maybe two dealerships on average now. That means if they're not coming to you first or second, they're probably not coming to you. But if they're shopping you, you should tell them why, you wanna, why they should buy from you. Um, I think that you know, just thinking back on my last car purchase, um, we only went to two different places, and if I'd known uh, what the experience I was going to have at the first place, I wouldn't have gone there. And I went to the second place, great experience, loved it, uh, loved the car. So uh, I have a couple of examples I want to show you guys here, and uh, just in case any of you guys are in the room, I apologize for just go ahead and ripping these off of YouTube without your permission, but I'm uh, going to throw this out here. So here's some, here's some examples that I want to show you real fast of, um, did a lot of searching on this, by the way. and. Believe it or not, there's, there's not as many good examples out there as I would like to have, have thought, but I just kind of want to show this for you here. So here's a good example. Hi, it's Steve Swartz at Phillips Chevrolet in Frankfurt. This is Angela Sullivan. Her and her husband Joe came in and got a uh, 2014 Chevrolet Suburban LTZ, white diamond, completely loaded. Yay! Yay! There it is, there it is. Uh, Angela's mom actually came in and got an Impala from me a few months ago, and her mom sent her in. And uh, how was your experience here, Phillips? My experience has been awesome. My mom raved about Steve, understandably. He's been awesome. It's been and fun. It's been fun. You've been a joy. You've given me a lot of laughs. <laughs> I love my vehicle. I love the service. I really appreciate everything you've done. High five. High five. Nice car. Come Thank see you. us. At, come see us at Phillips. 
So that's a great example of capturing that moment of when somebody is just so elated after just buying their car. They're so stoked, they, California term, sorry. Um, they are, they're so happy with that car uh, that, you know, that's a, that's a great example. One, one caveat I will say too is that there are very specific laws about what you can put in terms of like, you know, pe using people uh, and their likenesses online. You have to make sure that you get their permission to use these testimonials, especially for marketing purposes. Um, I'm definitely not a lawyer, but I'd highly recommend to do this, you don't. You should it and see what uh, see what sort of uh, release forms are, are necessary for that. But if you get somebody who's willing to do that for you, that's that's a great thing. And then, um, so imagine what that would be like if you had just left. You know, you were on a dealer's website. That that specific uh, Phillips Phillips Chevy uh, website. You left that website. You're in market to buy a car, and then you start seeing this on YouTube. That's a, that's a very powerful testimonial in terms of hey, I want to. That's they, I had a great experience. Um, they also had a tr uh, call tracking number in there, by the way, which I thought was which was a nice touch. Um, so here's another one where just uh, someone just basically wanted to thank you for visiting the website. All of us at Jura's a portion of Orland Park want to thank you for visiting our website and hope you found it informative and easy to navigate. We are here to serve all your Porsche needs and look forward to your visit to Jura's a Porsche in Orland Park soon. It was a pleasure to serve you. Have a great day. Very simple, very effective, and it's something where uh, you don't have to uh, go crazy with video production to have something that can be very, uh, very effective. So back to that same note, um, our partners at Google here have just released a very cool new feature. Have you guys heard about the YouTube Director app? A couple people. Uh, it's free. It's only for uh, iOS right now, so it's only for iPhones. Um, they're working on getting it ready for, uh, for, for Google Play. But essentially, it's, it's an app that you can download um, from the App Store, and then it walks you through, step by step, all of the different scripts that you need to basically build a video. Now, there's not one that's auto-specific in here, but there's like 15 or 20 different examples in there. You can kind of pick and choose, and they have a script. They talk you through, like, here's the way the shot should look, here's, here's the types of things you want to say, types of messaging. Um, very effective, and it's something that you can go out and do right now to get, on, to get in the game, because not everybody has uh, video ad production, and maybe not everybody has like, the, the budget to do you know, expensive video production. Um, something, as, as Kevin mentioned earlier, something where everybody, if you have a, have a, a fairly new smartphone, you've got a really powerful HD video camera on your phone, you can build your own videos and get online and get this going right, right, right now and today. One other, one other tip that I'd recommend too is, um, you know, if you're just trying to do this on your own, be a little shaky if you're doing it this way. So just invest a couple hundred bucks in a really nice tripod and just have that as part of the process and then you're, you're off to the races. So uh, finished about five minutes early here. So I want to thank you guys very much for your time. But um, Kevin and I can do a little Q&A if everybody's interested. And otherwise, if not, we're happy to hang around and uh, chat afterwards. Yes, sir. Yep. That's what I, it's, it's amazing. Those people, either they weren't promoting them or it's something where just a lot of people were not coming to their YouTube channels. Um, I think it's an underutilized, personal, my personal opinion is it's something that's very underutilized. I think we're all still trying to kind of crack the code uh, with video right now. And so, you know, it is, as marketers, it's something where I think just very, it can be very effective, but yeah. Yes, yes sir. Posting YouTube, posting your videos on YouTube or in a search. Yep. Yep. People who are posting yep. video on their servers are saying, oh, you don't need me on YouTube because uh, it's not really used for uh, SEO or SEM. Gotcha. So YouTube and uh, YouTube.com and Google.com are completely different, right? And so they don't talk to each other in any way, shape, or form. Those are two separate uh, campaign platforms. Uh, but you know, having presence on both is, 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 is obviously in your best interest to do so. Um, to go back to the previous question on the on the video views, one thing I've seen work really well is that once you have this amazing video content, um, evangelize it. Get your employees, get your customers to share it on their social networks so then they share it and they share it and they share it and all of a sudden that video becomes pseudo viral. Again, videos don't, are not made to be viral. They're, they're made because people are, that are doing them are passionate about what they're doing and people want to see that, that content. But go back. Yeah, yeah sure. Has 
You know what? I can't. You no, know, I can't speak to that at all. Um, something I can look into. We can exchange information afterwards, and I can find out. I, I would imagine there would be some SEO benefit of just making sure that they're linked somehow. But I can't. I to my can't can't speak yeah, to anything speak concrete. To yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just think it is right on the on the brand lift surveys? Yeah, I haven't done one. Hey, Megan. Megan, do you know on the brand lift surveys, do they give you an option to write them themselves? Write them yourself? The, the template is there. The template is there for the brand lift surveys on YouTube. Again, we can exchange information afterwards, but yes, there's templates there but you're able to, to customize that. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for coming today and spending your Thanks, morning. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate it. Thank you.